Um, I'm Charlie Adler. I'm an educator. Uh, I've worked with educational reform in the United States. I've taught. I was a principal. I've started uh, many schools over the years in different countries from the United States to Australia to uh, South Sudan and um, in India. You spent the last couple of months here in India. We are still sitting here in yes. Ahmedabad. Yes. Uh, if you would compare the situation in the field of education with India and America, do you see any major differences? Yes. I think okay. one of the big differences here is that only 30% of all high school age students are actually in high school and um, yeah, 70 percent are not in high school and I don't know the numbers but there's a very small number that actually graduate uh, mm. from the 12th year so it's education is far less accessible here um, and it is limited uh, for, to the most part for the upper levels of society mm. and um, as bad as the public school system is in America, it's much worse here where the classes have, in the government schools, 75 students in a class and the teacher basically stands up front and just talks at you. So, and they've inherited a lot of that from the British education system, mm -hmm. uh, memorizing by rote, and a lot of education is geared towards uh, the exams that they need to get into mm. higher education. Um, what about the private sector in education? Well, there are some excellent schools in the private sector, though they're beyond the reach of 99%. So. You know, uh, the I mean, if, if you figure the cost. 100,000 rupees to 500,000 rupees, depending on the school, per year. And... For day school? For day school. Okay. 500,000? Yeah, there's, there's one in Ahmedabad that's pretty close to that. Um, and the average... And, and you have, what, 60% of India living on 24 rupees a day. Uh, you know, that's just an absurd number. Do you have any idea how the Indians, I mean, there are a couple of good examples, as you mentioned. How can they scale it and how can they make it more accessible for those who live at least middle class, not talking about those living below poverty line? It's hard. I think the middle class in India, like the middle class everywhere around the world, is the one who get screwed. There are no programs for them. So at least there's a government program that says 25% of the school should be kids from the lowest echelon, yeah. the lowest socioeconomic level. And for a middle class family, it's sort of like a middle class family in America wanting to send their kids to a private university. You don't get financial aid because you make too much, though you'll be wiped out financially if you try to, to, to pay for it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still paying loans from my daughter's college and will be till the year 2027. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's hard to scale. It really is because the private schools, the kids, the needs are so different of the kids coming in from, from the top 1% um, compared to the to, to the, you know, the differences are so wide that, you know, even at Riverside, where in the lower grades we have a quarter of the kids are, a lot of them are the servants, children, and so yeah. forth, yeah. but simple things like birthday parties have become an issue, where when the poor kids go to a birthday party, they feel humiliated, they feel, well, never, I can't do this for my kid, yeah. lunches. The poor parents cannot afford the same lunches. Anyone brings lunch to school. Yeah. So the lunch that the richer kid brings is maybe worth a week's salary for, for, for someone else. Yeah. Um, and 
at a young age, you know, they don't know quite the difference that much. But as they get older, I really wonder how it's going to play out. Mm -hmm. um, so you have your doubts? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a noble idea. Um, and I think it's on the right track, but I don't think it's been thought out um, of, of the things that have to be compensated for. You know, for example, okay. there is a study in, in the New York, it's an article in the New York Times, which I can send you, that basically by the age of three, you can almost determine where a kid is going to go. And that is, uh, this was done in America, they compared parents with graduate degrees and parents on welfare. And the children of parents with graduate degrees heard, um, what was the number, but it's, it may even be 500 times more, more utterances. Yeah. So, you know, in other words, the parents talk to them. Oh, you know, let's look at this and do this. Yeah. Um, number two, they heard also five to ten times as many positive statements as a, you know instead of hearing oh you're stupid why'd you do this stop they hear oh it fell let's clean it up together you know it's a, it's a whole different process so um by the age of three kids who may be born with the same intelligence on iq tests it's already spreading and they already have it in their mind you know the, the wealthier kids to um how to ask questions, how to analyze. They're not afraid to do that. Um, the number one correlation between how a child does on their college entrance exams is the level of education of their mother. You know, and I've seen it in, in we've had schools that have had mixed populations, and we've had the poor uh, ghetto kids who may have been my best students. And then I had, and they had the best grades. And then I had the stoner kids, you know, the, the, the heavy pot smoking kids whose parents were professors, all right? And when it came to the college entrance exam, they still scored 200 points higher. So, and, and basically did not do a lot of studying at all. Mm -hmm. But it's this basic level of language that you hear, it's, you know, just having books around the house makes a difference. Um, so, and here, the difference between rich and poor is far more dramatic. And you have generations of people who weren't even allowed to talk to other people. You know, you have former untouchables. You have a caste system that supposedly doesn't exist, that still is, permeates every aspect of life. And, you know, in a school like Riverside, where they try to expose the students by taking them to slums and so forth, um, it's funny, when I asked the students why they do this and why they work with the kids, it became all about them, as opposed to not helping the kids, but it's about, you know, it, it, it's public service for us, and it's good, and, and, and so forth. Um, I, I did a class with them, and I wish I could have continued, but I asked them what they knew about, every single kid has servants, maids, cooks, drivers, anywhere from one to ten. And I asked them, how much do you know about them? And their assignment was actually, they had to go and talk to them, yeah. you know, to find out about their lives. So. I don't even think they see them as, as people in some way. Um, you know, they're just people that, or they have a use. And um, it's going to take, it's going to take generations. And I think, you know, the media helps. It'll speed things up. And maybe there needs to be a, a, a lower caste, um, uh, spring, you know, where it spreads onto the internet. But another thing is, you know, the internet, uh, India only has 11% in the, uh, internet penetration. Mm. But mobile phone is pretty strong. Yeah, but can they get online with it? 
you know, the, the question is, um, you know, can kids do research on their mobile phone and can they afford a plan, a data plan as well? So having a phone and having internet access is, is, is very different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a computer is just not affordable. It's, um, again, think about the, the, the cost when you're making so little. Um, just recently, I read the top 5%, their income's gone up 35% in the last two years. The bottom 1%, you know, the bottom 40% or whatever it is, their income's went up 3%. I mean, you are drawing a pretty bad scenario here, but we are optimistic people, aren't we? Are. we? Yeah. So, but what but could be a solution? I, I, I think what we're looking for is a unique solution and not a solution based on Western success, because I don't think we'll get to that. And hopefully their ingenuity and will come up with, with something that totally breaks the mold. Because for them, I think to try to reach success in a country of 1.2 billion, that's still more than 50% agrarian, um, it just won't work. Um, and, and the differences are going to get wider and wider. But you have this great, I mean, they are innovative. They manage to, to, to I mean, they figure out things. They, they, they're, they're, you know, they've got great engineers. But it's going to have to be a unique Indian model, and um, and I think from my Western eyes, I can't see a solution. I can't make the success of the West, which I broke into quotes because I don't even know if we're a success, um, uh, uh, work, work here. here. But I have some fears also. I, I really do. You know, even in, in fears in which way? Well, I have fears that. Um, they become incredibly um, um, uh, cons consumerist. You know, it, it's all about making money. Um, so many of the professions are chosen based on money because that's the way, that's what's valued here. But that's also like the same in China or the same in, in Brazil yeah. in these BRICS it, countries. Yeah, it's, it's in, in all developing countries. And I think what they're all going to lose is a quality of life that they have that we don't have in the West. You know, the family and, and, and the intimacy, and there's the confusion, I think, of developing countries, and in the West we do it also, of thinking that if standard of living goes up, then your quality of life goes up. And that's not true. I think, yes, your medical services are better. You may have, may be able to go to a movie and who knows what else and own a color TV. Mm -hmm. but are you happier? You know, and, and, yeah. and, and, and I don't see it. Um, and, and people are very comfortable here in their, knowing where they fit in their hierarchy. And with it getting broken, it's, it's I, I think, disrupting a lot. It, 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 again, it, it's fascinating what's going to happen. Um, we've seen it happen throughout history, but never in, in an dimension. age of, of, of yeah. in this age where where information spreads so quickly, yeah. um, and also where you know it depends where they jump on the train as well. Where you know there used to be professions that you could do it. Your father, did, your father did it. Your grandfather did it. Here. A third of the professions that little kids are going to go into don't exist today. They don't even know what they are. And if they can grab onto that, you know, they sort of did that with engineering and yeah, kind computers of, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, they were able to bypass uh, having to install telephones, you know, which, which is, you know, cell phones. So they didn't go through, you know, countries going through this 20 years ago were investing tons of money into a technology that, that really it just disappeared. Um, the government is corrupt and, yeah. you know, it's where are the tax dollars going. You know, there's a whole movement now. Uh, people are protesting as we speak about um, the money in Swiss bank accounts they want returned mm -hmm. to India mm -hmm. it should be used. So 
but it is an optimistic country. You know, that being said, they do feel they're on the upswing. You know, it's a big contrast with, with America right now, where America feels like we're not going to be better off than our parents. And they do feel they're going to be better off. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you've been here this year for four months, four and a half, five, five, five months. Together, yeah. uh, what were your major learnings? My major learnings. Uh, the mm. first thing is um, that I'll never understand India. And um, also that, um, and, and part of that is the way of thinking is so different that you can't really understand it from Western eyes. And it's very easy to judge what we see and without understanding how it evolved and maybe it's just certain things just aren't that bad for them mm -hmm. you know one of the big statements somebody said to me that hit me when i asked her um, a teacher an indian and i said how do you deal with the poverty she said why do you have to deal with it so it's kind of it just is and it will be just like there's rain and sunshine, there's people living on the streets. Um, I, I learned, it just reinforced what a selfish species we are. You know, it, it, it's, you know, I came back from Sudan no longer believing in the goodness of mankind. And, and due to certain things I saw there, and it was a very, um, life-shattering experience and all my friends will tell you that I'm a darker person since then. Yeah. I really am. And here I do see how those who succeed, really very few will look back and want to help. You know, okay. and, and, you know to see a you know, I, I saw a Bentley the other day, you know, and I wish I had a picture of it. It was right next to the homeless people. And, and oh, I, oh. He made it. He made it. When did you get here? Oh, okay. So you saw the Bentley. And you think about that. I mean, that's a, that's 200 years of income for some people. You know, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. And... I don't think we're, 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 we're willing to sacrifice enough to make the society better. You don't think so? No. And, and um, you know, we did something in class also. They have a riverfront project that's great, but they displace 20,000 people. It's a beautiful project, and I was asking the students, you know, is it okay to displace people? So. At first they said, yeah, it's totally wrong, but for something like this it's okay because it's going to make the city better. So if it's something that's going to benefit them, it's okay to take 20,000 people and just move them. They took out all the slums in that area. So it's not a real we, what we are talking about, huh? You doubt that people are willing to build a real crater we? Absolutely. I think they're willing to talk it. But I don't think they're willing to do it. And, and, um, so what kind of advice, and this would be my last question, though, would you give us, Egon and me, who are trying to build this we school in rural India? What would be your advice? My advice would be... Don't say leave it. No. <laughs> but to integrate it as much into the local village as possible and not see it to see it as a, as a, um, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, organic, to see it as organically growing out of the village and not an external thing that's been put into it, and listen to what people have to say, and don't be afraid to really listen, as opposed to going in with your ideas and then just hearing what you want to hear. Mm. which is, you know, the arrogant Western way of doing things.